Uh, really appreciate everyone being here today. Um, and uh, we've got, now we have a panel of, of public policymakers that are going to talk about some of the things that they're doing, some of the positive things that are happening in the state of Nebraska related to uh, climate change and environmental issues. My name's Ken Winston. I'm the coordinator for this event. And I'm going to start off by just giving the, the bio, bios of the people here, uh, the, of our presenters uh, for our noon event. Um, so Josh Moaning is the mayor of the city of Norfolk. He was elected to the Norfolk City Council in 2012, mayor in 2016, and re-elected in 2020. He's director of a, the clean energy group, New Power Nebraska, and owns a, and operates a small business in the field of renewable energy development. He assists his family's beef business and has two children, Molly and Henry. He's a graduate of the University of Nebraska and has completed the Harvard Kennedy School's Climate Change Policy, Economics, and Politics Executive Program. In 2020, he was elected to serve on the board of directors of the National League of Cities. I'm just going to do all the, the bios of, all, of everybody up here. Chelsea Johnson is the Deputy Director of the Nebraska Conservation Voters, a nonprofit that protects our state's environment by educating voters, advocating for sound policies, and electing conservation champions. She is a member of the Lincoln Electric System Board of Directors and is currently serving her se second term on the Lower Platte South NRD Board. Benny Schaub is one of seven members of the Lincoln City Council. He was elected to his second four-year term in May of 2021. Benny grew up in Bowling Green, Kentucky and attended Western Kentucky University where he earned bachelor's and master's degrees. During the years, this year's city budgeting process, Benny added funds in support of the city's climate action plan. He looks forward to hearing from you and working with you to do more to, Lincoln's, to reduce Lincoln's carbon footprint. Senator Anna Wishart was elected to the Lincoln Airport Authority Board in 2011 and has served as, as the chair of that board. She was twice elected to the Lincoln uh, le Legislature from District uh, 27 in 2016 and 2020. She was elected to serve District 27 and she currently serves as the Vice Chair of the Legislature's Appropriations Committee. She's also worked as a Director of Partnerships at Beyond School Bells and she currently works at Monolith, Monolith Materials, a next generation chemical and in engineering company that believes technology will create a path to environmental transformation. Senator Wishart is married to Joe Coleman, a former Lincoln police officer who now works as a guidance counselor at Good Goodrich Middle School. She enjoys horseback riding, long distance running, traveling, and watching classic films. Uh, I believe we're gonna start off with jo Josh. Okay, is this on? You guys can hear me? All right. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, again. This is my second time at the Youth Climate Summit. I think the last time we were all together was 2019. Is that right? Okay, so it's good to see that this tradition continues. Uh, I, again, am the mayor of the city of Norfolk, Nebraska. Who's been to Norfolk? Anyone? few of you. All right. Well, more than I thought. Okay, good. Um, so the first thing I'll say about Norfolk is you, you hear me saying Norfolk and not Norfolk, like Virginia or England, right? Uh, that's because the city, in a convoluted way, is named after the North Fork of the Elkhorn River, which I'm going to talk about here in just a couple minutes as one of the natural resources that we're working to preserve and actually uh, um, you utilize as uh, economic uh, growth opportunity for us, as well as a climate solution. So that is going to be the theme of my short comments here today. I've got a few slides to show you some of the projects that are going on in Norfolk uh, right now. But uh, that narrative I want to try to express is that what we're here today to talk about in terms of working towards climate solutions can also, in our communities, um, be economic and social growth opportunities. And I think we're seeing that play out in some of our communities and seeing the advantages and benefits of being proactive and intentional about working towards climate solutions that also have economic and social benefits in our communities. So um, Norfolk in the last few years uh, has really tried to uh, become a place that's hospitable 
and welcoming and attractive to young people because we realize as a rural community in the state, if we're not that, um, we don't have much chance going into the future to be viable and uh, to be a um, strong and growing community. So we've invested intentionally a lot in our quality of life and quality of life enhancements. And inherent, I think, in quality of life is a clean, healthy, and safe natural environment. And so I'm going to talk about three areas in which we're trying to uh, promote that as a way of life and uh, do good where we can um, and participate in, um, the, in, in climate solutions that are also growth opportunities for us. So this is a, I've got a few slides. Um, actually, last week, the Tree City USA, the Nebraska Tree City USA conference was held in Norfolk. So I'm recycling this uh, presentation. It's going to be tree uh, heavy, but that is one of the things, I think, the low-hanging fruit uh, uh, work opportunities that we have to um, start work today in terms of climate solutions. So um, we're going to go through this. I'm not going to monopolize the time here. But uh, again, being proactive, um, cities the size of Norfolk not always historically have paid a lot of attention to um, trees in, in terms of a, a city organized proactive way. So one of the things we did earlier this year was uh, put in place a community forester, an urban forester, um, and she is spearheading our uh, tree planting initiatives, which include um, public-private partnerships. We work pretty strongly. You're going to hear from Chelsea, who's a board member of the of, uh, Natural Resources District here in Lincoln. We work very closely with our Natural Resources District, the Lower Elkhorn, uh, to help get trees to people. So one of the initiatives that... Um, we put a lot of work into over the last couple of years was a campaign 2020 and 2020. So it was, uh, our goal was to plant 2020 trees in Norfolk in 2020. This was all planned out, of course, and be before anybody knew uh, COVID would happen. Um, it actually ended up kind of being a silver lining with so many people being at home and focused on home improvement projects that uh, they decided to plant some trees. So. Again, that was a way we were able to secure some trees to give away to people through our NRD and through the Nebraska Forest Service and the Arbor Day Foundation. So I would stress that in communities that partnerships with a lot of these groups that are already purposed to do this work uh, can be very pow powerful and can help get things done. Um, we've also, in this regard, been really intentional about green infrastructure and streetscape, improving our major corridors by adding green green terraces to them. So when we do major infrastructure reconstruction projects, uh, we always want to make sure that um, we have a terrace uh, that includes, includes street trees because that does have uh, benefits in cooling, um, runoff mitigation, preserving our infrastructure. These are just a few examples of uh, ongoing projects right now and designs in terms of those streetscape improvements that I'm talking about and greening up those corridors. Um, a tree canopy, a, a healthy um, tree canopy throughout the community in our public spaces is very important. Uh, downtown Norfolk has gone through a lot of changes in the last few years, uh, but one of the things that um, uh, benefit our downtown is that 35, 40 years ago, someone decided to plant a bunch of trees uh, throughout our downtown and believed in the importance of street trees and again those streetscape uh, improvements and now we have a very mature tree canopy throughout our downtown which improves the look and feel and obviously has uh, environmental benefits as well more more projects and programs to help where we can step by step pl uh, place more trees in public spaces I'm going to move on here uh, to a couple of special projects that I think tie into uh, utilizing natural resources and preserving and conserving natural resources and utilizing them as uh, community development opportunities. Uh, Johnson Park, uh, shown here, it was a WPA project uh, established back in the 1940s, early 1940s. It's right off of our downtown, and it's tied directly to that river I mentioned before, the North Fork of the Elkhorn River. Um, 
it was a beautiful park, a people attraction park for not just the community, but the region uh, for a long time, uh, until the mid 1960s when a flood, a major flood, uh, kind of wiped it out. And ever since then, it's been more or less minimally maintained. We have uh, plans now that are underway to change that and bring back that area and the riverfront to um, uh, a place where uh, people can congregate uh, congregate and use uh, that natural resource as recreation. And so uh, Johnson Park improvements are displayed here, uh, but one of the major um, efforts here is to tie this park, this historic park, back to the North Fork of the Elkhorn River. And uh, just in a nutshell, very briefly, the um, one of the main components of this project is to make that river usable for recreation and return it to its more natural course. This is where Norfolk started. The first commercial endeavor was a flour mill powered by a dam on the North Fork. Uh, that's all gone away, but uh, a remnant of the dam structure is a spillway that is still in place that creates a 13 and a half foot abrupt drop in the river channel. So we are now in the process of removing that dam structure, that spillway, and in its place putting in eight different drop structures over a half mile span that will create a River Rapids water trail um, just off of our downtown on the North Fork. So these are some conceptual uh, renderings of the park and how it will flow into the river space. Some real to life um, pictures of the of those drops that I'm referring to. Um, four of them, four of the eight, are now in place. And by this time next year, uh, this project should be done and we'll be moving into the parks improvements part of this. And again, why is this important? Because um, in my perspective anyway, we're building off of our history. We're utilizing a natural resource to promote recreation. We're preserving and conserving natural resources. All of this work should uh, come together to improve water quality. Uh, the more people that are using this river and waterway as uh, recreation, um, I think people are going to want to know what's in the water, right? And so that will help us uh, continue to do education and uh, proactive work about improving water quality um, in our area. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, renewable energy and how important that is to community planning um, and how, how important it's been to Norfolk in the Northeast Nebraska regional economy. Um, there's been a lot of wind development. Nebraska has been a slow adopter uh, to wind energy compared to other states around us. Uh, but we're starting to catch up and a lot of that um, uh, development has taken place in northeast Nebraska uh, in and uh, around Norfolk in the last five to seven years. And I can tell you that has had a tremendous benefit for our local economy in terms of new jobs, um, technician jobs. Uh, Northeast Community College has the only accredited uh, wind energy training program in the state. And so that's a pipeline where students 10 years ago had to go find jobs in Iowa or Minnesota because they didn't exist here, can now stay uh, closer to home and um, uh, start families and start careers in rural Nebraska. Uh, but also the construction phase jobs, all of those things contribute to a strong local economy and, uh, and, and utilizes an area of importance and emerging demand uh, in the marketplace. Picture here, this last slide, is of a community solar farm that uh, just went online in Norfolk earlier this year in June. And to date, it is the largest solar facility in the state of Nebraska. It's eight and a half megawatts, and it's tied to a battery energy storage system. We worked with a private developer and our power uh, provider, MPPD, uh, to get this done. And it's, it's not only the right thing to do socially and environmentally, but it's also saving people money on their energy bills because the cost of solar is lower now than conventional energy. So by participating, Norfolk citizens buying uh, solar shares in this project, they can save on average 15 to $20 a month on their energy bills. And we think that's a good thing for everyone. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and, and we can move on to other panels, but I, I look forward to taking questions later. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mayor Monning. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're going to move to uh, Councilman Shope. 
Is this on? It's on? It's working? Wow. Hi, everyone. My name is Benny Shobe. I'm one of seven members of the Lincoln City Council. Quick civics lesson. Lincoln is divided into a quadrant system with four quadrants, northeast, southeast, southwest, and northwest. And then we have three at-large council people for a total of seven. I'm one of those at-larges, so I get to represent the whole city. Everybody here, this is my domain. And I care about my domain. The city council, along with the county board, we're all concerned about the future of Lincoln. All of us together believe that climate change is real and we have to do things. And in part of that, the city a few years ago passed something called the Climate Action Plan, City of Lincoln's Climate Action Plan. And we outlined 118 things that we, the city government, and the community can do to improve our city and to lower our carbon footprint. The mayor gave us a goal of lowering our carbon footprint by 2050, about 30%, I think was the number. And we're working toward that. And in, with that in mind, and the help of a few people in this room, last budget cycle I introduced a resolution that would move money from the general fund to urban development to help people in low-income communities in our, neighbor, in our city replace existing furnaces and, and hot water heaters with heat pump and energy efficient systems to reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, we have several other programs in place already that would help people maintain their housing stock as part of our affordable housing action plan. And I thought this would be a good way for those people who are trying to keep their existing homes in place, keep that housing available, to also retrofit it with something that had a smaller carbon footprint. And for me, that's the first step. I mentioned earlier there are 118 points in that climate action plan. I just picked out a couple of them, and I look forward to working with you and doing some more things. I'm a really smart guy. I have 2.9 college degrees. <laughs> Never finished the PhD. But I don't know what you know. So as a, as a leader in the community, as an elected official, I want to hear from you about things we can do. You're doing things already. We don't hear about that. I have a list of things that we can do, and I, together we can work to improve the city. We're working on affordable housing, we're working on reducing our carbon footprint, and we're working on climate resiliency. And I think you all have a place to play in that role, and I look forward to working with you and getting those things done. I'm going to stop talking now and hand the microphone to... Thank you, Councilman Shobe. Uh, now we'll go to Senator Wishart. Well, hi, everybody. It's it's good to see all of you, and, and like... Like the councilman, I'm excited to hear more from you, what brought you here today. Um, for some of you, it sounds like uh, you've been here before, and, and so I'm interested in what your climate journey is and, and why you want to be here and part of this youth council. As Ken said, I'm a state senator in District 27, which is the western portion of Lincoln and then um, portions of Lancaster County. We actually call it the Horse District because I represent everything from Wilderness Park, Pioneers Park, all the acreages, and the racetrack casino. So um, it's, a, it's a fantastic district to represent. Uh, I've been in public service for uh, about six years in terms of my role as the state legislature. What drove me to run for office was uh, how much I deeply cared about the environment and the role that the state legislature plays in making sure that we're le leaving a legacy and, and a healthy environment for future generations. Uh, I'm somebody who cares deeply about the outdoors and our ecosystem and, and animals and human health and, and all of that. And so it's, it's something I think about a lot. And it's very easy to feel overwhelmed about the task that this world has ahead of it to address climate change. And what I wanna tell you today is that I'm actually wearing two hats. So I'm a state senator, so I've experienced the challenges of moving policy that protects our environment through a public space. Um, but I also work at Monolith, which is a clean technology company. It's an over billion dollar company. Um, it will be the, one of the largest clean hydrogen producing companies in the world. And what we do is basically the equivalent of a million tons of CO2 not going into the atmosphere. And so I've gotten to see what's going on in the private sector in terms of transformational technologies that are going to help solve some of our most challenging issues around decarbonization. 
And it is a really pivotal and exciting time to be in the climate change and decarbonization space in this world. And so what I want to actually bring to you today is a sense of relief and inspiration that I have uh, in, in the innovation that is happening in particular in this country right now to address some of our most challenging issues when it comes to climate change. How many of you are aware of the Paris Climate Agreement? So we're gonna talk a lot on the local level, but I wanna really bring this up to like a macro global level um, because it's gonna take more than just Nebraska and the United States to address decarbonization issues. And over 100 plus countries came together and they signed a compact, a treaty that says that by 2050, as a world, we want to get to zero carbon emissions into the atmosphere. That's a very, very aggressive goal, very aggressive goal. But I had a chance two weeks ago to sit at a conference that was run by the Department of Energy. It was a ministerial series, it's the first ever, where ministers from around the world came to Pittsburgh and they sat and met with probably 6,000 representatives from private industries and government that are working on the next generation technologies that are going to help the world meet that 2050 decarbonization goal. And it was one of the most inspiring moments I have had um, because of the opportunities out there. And I wanted to read a quote to you that I texted my mom and sister. I had the opportunity to um, sit and listen to a panel um, of ministers that included the energy minister for the Ukraine. And as you can imagine, any of you who have been following Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, one of the issues that this country and Europe have realized is, that, is how important it is to be energy secure in terms of not only um, you know, financially, um, but you're, for democracy. And what he said, and I thought this is so powerful and I wanted to bring this message to all of you, is he said, clean energy is not only about ecology. He said, clean energy is the security that brings you freedom. I thought that was such a powerful message to hear. So what does that mean for Nebraska? You know, when you think globally about all of the energy that is going into solving this issue. Actually, first I wanna say, what does that mean for the United States? If any of you have been following a recent piece of legislation that passed, it was called the Inflation Reduction Act. And there are a lot of different iterations of it. Um, but I just read an incredible New York Times article that was one of the more inspirational articles I've read in a while. Like, I've read it three times now. And what it talked about is that piece of bill had the largest investments in the history of the world in terms of climate change. It is going to unlock so much private and public investment into wind, into solar, into technologies we can't even imagine yet that are going to help us decarbonize some of the toughest industries to decarbonize. And that's happening here in the United States. That's our country. We, we took the lead on that. Um, this article talks about the fact that we are going to be, as a country, because of this legislation, the leading country in terms of addressing climate change, and that now more than ever is the time for young people to think about going into that industry. There's gonna be so many job opportunities opening up for all of you to be in engineering fields, um, being in the human re resources, just every type of, of space you would wanna go into in clean tech companies and in governmental roles, um, helping to address climate change. So now you think about what does that mean for Nebraska? As a state, and Josh talked about this, Mayor Moaning did, like we, have the resources to help the world meet our clean energy goals. We have the third best wind access and capabilities 
in the country. I mean, gold standard opportunities in terms of capturing our wind resources and turning that in to energy and helping to, you know, helping to run all of the types of things that, that you need for civilization to move forward. We have the ninth best solar in the country. And what's great about our solar is it happens during the winter. I think you've all stepped out and thought like, it's gonna be a warm day. And then, cause it's all sunny and then you step outside and it's the coldest <laughs> day you've ever experienced. We get a lot of sun in the winter, which is a really actually important time because everybody's heat bills require more energy. We have, we have an agricultural community and capabilities that can act as a huge carbon storage sink. And we haven't even, I mean, there's so much activity going on in the agricultural world in that space, and it's really exciting how farmers are now able, uh, and the market is growing for farmers to capture carbon within their farming practices and help to reduce emissions. And we have incredible water resources, and Chelsea and her team have taken amazing care and responsibility of those resources as well. And so what I, what I wanted to impart on all of you is that, you know, if I had looked at myself maybe three years ago and, and sort of the doom scrolling that I was doing um, about our future, I feel very different now. And I also feel really excited for all of you because there is going to be so many opportunities for you to get involved in this new energy space where a ton of investment is going and your future is very bright in, in that and, and I'm happy to talk with you more about that because where you're sitting right now in your education, there are opportunities to lean in um, and, and to, um, to set your trajectory towards a career in which you're gonna help us address some of these challenges, thanks. Richard, now, now it's time for Chelsea Johnson. Thank you. All right, I'll try to close up here quickly so that we can get to questions, but um, I just want to echo a lot of what Senator Wishart was saying around feeling really positive right now. Um, I think I was in a similar boat um, doom scrolling a few years back, but there's been so much progress made, um, not only internationally and at the um, federal level with the Inflation Reduction Act, but there's been so much progress locally as well. Um, how many folks in here are aware of the um, public power districts in Nebraska? A few of you. Okay, so I'll give a very brief overview. So Nebraska is the only state in the country that is 100% um, powered by public utilities. So that means that instead of having a private company provide us with our electricity, we actually elect uh, boards of directors who then make decisions about our electricity, um, where it comes from, how much it costs. Um, they make a lot of decisions. And some of the decisions that they've made in the last three years um, are to decarbonize. So all of Nebraska's generating electric utilities have now committed to net zero carbon goals. And some of those goals are to be net zero carbon by 2050. Um, Lincoln Electric System, which is the board that I serve on, is committed to be net zero carbon by 2040. And that was one of the most exciting things that, um, that has happened to me um, to see Nebraska take that step, particularly because I think the perception of Nebraska um, on a national level is that making those kinds of commitments is not very politically popular. But the reality is that those decisions were made by elected board members. And so we can see that um, decarbonizing, supporting clean energy really is a policy area that has broad bipartisan support. And, um, and that should carry a lot of, of weight and help people all over the country feel confident about decarbonizing and not paying a political price for doing so. 
So um, that brings me really quick to something that I wanted to talk about because Ken had asked us to speak in particular about things that you can do uh, to make a difference on policy. And and it is in that political arena, in my view, um, both in terms of uh, meeting with your elected officials one-on-one -on -one as groups and sharing with them your personal stories about how um, your, you are personally impacted, how your community is personally impacted by the decisions that they are making, um, as well as getting involved in elections. Um, exactly one month from today, well, not exactly one month, but about a month from today um, is the 2022 midterm elections. And it's a really important election year. Every year is an important election year. But um, there's we're on a really positive forward momentum um, in the United States and in Nebraska on environmental policy. And it's really important that we keep that momentum going. And Nebraska has many layers that directly affect the environment, um, which makes us unique. You know, we have the nonpartisan legislature, um, which that in itself is unique. And the legislature has a lot of power and authority over environmental policy in Nebraska. Uh, like I said, we're the only state that is a 100% public power state. So when you vote for your public power representative, if you live in an area um, uh, that is represented by that, then um, you're making decisions directly about carbon emissions. Um, when you are uh, voting for your NRD director, which I did not get to, but I'm also on the Laura Platt South NRD board, and Nebraska is unique in that arena too because we have NRDs that are um, – their boundary lines are built around um, watersheds instead of arbitrary political lines like counties or other, you know, kind of random political boundaries that most other states have. So that allows us to take a really holistic view of water management. And you elect those people, too, who make those decisions. So I've been on the ballot, and we have another Lower Platte South NRD director in the room, Bruce Johnson, in the back. Um, and so – um, and just speaking about our NRD, we're very um, focused on what we can do about climate. So I'll wrap up there, um, but I guess I won't because volunteer, volunteer, volunteer <laughs> um, in the elections this year if you can. So now I'll wrap up. Well, thanks, everybody. Well, are there some questions? Be glad to walk the microphone over to you. Thank you for coming and speaking with us today. Um, I've got kind of a quirky one, so let me frame it first. Um, it's in the line of thinking of like Richard Kahn, um, and the best way I can think of it is when they talk about like the UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, you can boil it down to how sustainable development is an oxymoron or could be construed as such. So we talk about incentivizing sustainable development, um, but are there any mechanisms that you all are exploring about disincentivizing development? Like, where do we draw the line and say, stop? I think of in Omaha, Omaha Native is, you just see this massive expansion of suburban building and development, and that's development, you know? And no matter which way you slice it, that's encroaching on spaces that perhaps we should think about. Go no, go ahead. You go ahead. Why? You go. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> it's your city. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to stand up. It makes it a little easier for me. So, yes. If, I have some mental health issues. In my free time, I watch lots of climate YouTube videos. And I watched one recently about how much suburbanization has destroyed our country. And I'm thinking, wow, I can't condemn a lot of people that want to live in the suburbs. But in Lincoln, we have... A, a housing shortage. And so we're encouraging people to develop housing and it runs counter to what you're saying. But what we're doing is we're trying to incentivize through TIF districts and other methods to people to encourage development back in the core of the city where the infrastructure is already in place. We're also working on sustainable food and sustainable agriculture. We're, part of our climate action plan is to identify areas around the edges of our city that would be good for those things 
and try to put policies in place to make sure they don't become developed. We have a long range uh, comprehensive develop, comprehensive plan on where we're going to grow and where we're going to build. And we have places that are already set off for development. We're trying to do smart development. We have to have more housing for more people for a growing city. But we, as you said, we also need to make sure we protect all the environmental problems, all the environmental resources we have available. The big discussion that we're having now with the city is flood water and flood water management. And that's an ongoing conversation, but we, we have to do more smart development. And we're working together with anybody that wants to come to the table to talk about that. I don't think I have a whole lot more to add to that, but that emphasis on infill development, utilizing uh, areas of the community where there's already existing infra infrastructure has been very important to us too. And so cities can um, adopt policies that promote that. Uh, for example, just a few weeks ago, our city council approved a tiny home uh, uh, zoning district because uh, what we're seeing in the marketplace matches up with sustainable development, if you want to call it that anyway, and housing in terms of demand for smaller units, higher density, in walkable neighborhoods, and I think that's important. So that's one way we can do that. Um, I, I'd also men mention things like um, in our community, uh, we're, for communities our size, public transit is not usually a thing, or at least a, not a very comprehensive uh, public transit system, but we're building one. And I, I venture to say it's, it's pretty innovative uh, for uh, anywhere in Nebraska, and we want to do that so that transportation is accessible for people living anywhere in the community. Um, it, it's an, almost an assumption in Nebraska that you have to have a car to do anything and go anywhere. It doesn't have to necessarily be that way um, if we adopt and implement systems that uh, have a mind toward accessibility, making sure that people have um, the resources and systems they need to move around in a community without having access to a car at all times. I would love to add one thing to that, and I'm like uh, Benny, going to give away the the, um, the geeking out I do on. Um, uh, I tend to read a lot of like futuristic blogs. My Gallup strength is futurist, so I I love reading from engineers and people in the really technical space about um, just the future of city planning. And one thing that was really exciting to me is I brought the first piece of legislation on autonomous vehicles. Um, and one of the reasons why I brought it was mobility for people who are uh, visually impaired and for seniors. But in doing my research, found that a lot of projections with autonomous vehicles, and we're talking 15 years from now, that's, I mean, that's not that far away, is that when you have autonomous vehicles and they're working off of a grid system, and sure, there's all different kind of holes you could poke in this, but just let's say it works out. Um, then what happens is you get rid of the need for parking. And so in terms of cities where you have a lot of cement uh, in that city for, for concrete for parking, um, the opportunities for infilling all of those unnecessary parking spots now that people are able to call a vehicle, get in it, it takes them somewhere, it drives off, they go into their uh, wherever they need to go, is that you could fill that with green spaces. And so there are some blogs that kind of map out in the future what it would look like if you didn't have the same parking needs and instead that could be filled in in with green spaces and it's really exciting. So those are the types again of innovations where they can seem really distant um, but especially in the United States I mean you are all the faces of the people who are going to be in, in a lot of ways coming up with those creative solutions. Okay I just have a quick question this is about Norfolk so I have family that live there and they don't, they're not really the type of people that would care about a solar farm um, or planting trees. I was just wondering, how did you make that happen? Fair, fair question. Um, you know, I talked before about the bottom line, making this about economic opportunities too. So the, so the solar facility, when it became clear that uh, by building to the size and scale that we did that the energy would be cheaper than 
conventional uh, energy that we're purchasing from APPD, that became a pretty easy sell to the council and uh, to the public. So um, when people are looking at saving again, you know, households 15 to $20 a month on their energy bills and businesses even more, um, that, that speaks to people in real terms. So they may not be motivated necessarily by the environmental or uh, impacts right away, but it's a good foot in the door to tell the story of why this is important that way, but it's also um, saving you money. And that's um, it's a pretty good conservationist message, I think, in my mind. So um, that and recycling, I think a lot of Nebraska, especially rural Nebraska, I come up from a farm family background, one of the lasting messages that my grandfather and father taught me is, if it's useful, use it. Don't waste anything. So there's this instinctive, I think, uh, tendency that even conservative Nebraskans have to be resourceful and use our natural resources in a way that create real life benefits for us all living in communities. So we only have like another minute. So uh, we got a, uh, a couple questions on the uh, up behind you. Uh, does anyone want to take a you want to take a stab at one of those questions? I'll take a stab at the that first question. How can we get support from the environment on a school level? You know, one thing that I talk to a lot of university students about who ask me, you know, what is the best way that we can spend our time influencing um, uh, leaders in the community on uh, the benefits of, of helping address climate change. And one thing I remind them is, you know, while they're university students, um, they're basically voting members of the leadership who run the university. They have a lot, uh, they have a voice that they can push in terms of the university making, taking certain policies when it comes to say recycling or emissions or all of those types of things. Um, the same for all of you. You are uh, you are in a community in itself in a school, um, in the in the school that you exist in, and you should all feel empowered in that school to push for policies that helps make that school greener whether that be recycling and composting, whether that be looking at your building structure and whether there are ways to improve its energy efficiency. Um, all of those things are, you, you have a voice as members of this community while you're in this school um, that uh, you can use to, to ask for those who are in leadership roles to, to take more of a leadership role in addressing these issues. Um, and, and frankly, you know, if you're successful, those are opportunities then for other youth um, to model that at their schools as well. And then the one other thing I would add, and it goes back to what Chelsea said, is you also can get engaged in your legislature. Uh, I brought a climate resolution for a group of Prairie Hill students, middle schoolers, um, two years in a row to the legislature. They drafted it, I introduced it for them. So there are opportunities for you to connect with your state senator and ask for them to be a voice for you on, on these issues as well. Have any closing remarks you want to make? Any any final comment you want to? Well, let's give it our our public policy makers uh, a hand. A round of applause. Thank thank you so much for being here.